This is Ona Lee with Claire's Canning, and today we're canning strawberry rhubarb bread and butter pickles. Cooking and canning with my grandma Clara at her little house in rural city are some of the best memories I have. And now I'm on a mission to preserve local food systems and traditions. By combining my lifetime of professional culinary and farming experience with generations of knowledge to bring you a fountain of skills and recipes to sustain and pass down. We are getting to the very bottom of food from the ground up, so I hope you'll join us. So it's spring here in Western Washington, which means that canning season is here. And we have some beautiful produce from our local farmer's market, and we're gonna do one of my favorite things, a bread and butter pickle with a twist. I know a lot of folks shy away from home canning out of fear of things like botulism or getting sick. And I wanna tell you that home canning is absolutely safe, but the procedures, the steps, and the recipes are exact and you should not freestyle. And if you're new to home canning, I really recommend getting a tried and true book like The Ball Complete Book of Home Preserving. There's tons of great recipes in here, but also in the back half, there's a chapter on page 411 called The Art and Science of Home Food Preservation. And it goes over all of the safety procedures you need to know to produce safe products at home. So I really recommend studying that. You will need a set of specific tools to do home canning. Number one, your jar grabber, jar tongs, whatever these are called. This is the classic design. They also have a newer design that has a spring in it so you don't have to do this weird fingery thing. But these are classic, they work. You need a canning funnel. These come in stainless steel or plastic. A magnet stick or a magic wand. This handy dandy tool picks up lids so that you are not making contact with the sterile item and you're not gonna burn yourself. How cool. <laughs> This is called a debubbler and a headspace measuring tool. This end is what you use to poke into the jars to remove all air bubbles. And on this end, there's a little ladder that you put on the edge of the jar to measure your headspace. And it comes with delineations like one inch, three quarters of an inch, one half of an inch, or a quarter. And this tool you will not find in a standard set of canning tools, but to me, it is absolutely crucial. This is a stainless steel ruler that I got for $2 in an office supply aisle at my local department store. It originally came with a cork backing that I really easily peeled off and it left no residue. So I definitely recommend picking up one of these. First things first, we need to sterilize our jars. This is a non-negotiable part of the process and the safest way to do it is in your water bath canner. When you're adding your jars to the boiling water, you wanna make sure you do it at an angle and fill them slowly so that you don't create a bubble that splashes hot water on your hand. Place the lid. Jars need to be boiled for at least 10 minutes to become sterile, so set a timer. So although this lid is technically brand new, it came on the jars that we just opened the gum has already been pretty seriously indented. So we're gonna need to crack open a box of brand new lids. So if you can see on this lid, the gum is not indented at all. And that is exactly what we're looking for. And I know there's a lot of you out there who think that you can reuse lids or you can use the lids that came on the jars. And I'm here to tell you that is not recommended. In this pot, we have some water and a tiny splash of distilled vinegar. It's over medium high heat and we wanna add our lids and get them to a very low simmer. This softens the gum on the edge of the lid and it creates a good seal when we're canning. The rings do not ever make contact with a food surface or the food itself, so they don't need to be sterilized and you can just set those aside for now. In this pot, we have two cups of distilled white vinegar at 5% acidity and one cup of cider vinegar at 5% acidity. To that, we're going to add two cups of raw cane sugar. I prefer raw cane sugar in my cooking, baking, and canning. You can use white granulated if that's what works for you. To that, we're also going to add half a cup of sea salt. 
It's my preference to use sea salt, but you might like to use kosher or canning or pickling salt. I prefer to buy my spices in smaller quantities at my local co-op because they are fresher and taste better. To our salt, sugar, and vinegar mixture, we're going to add two tablespoons of yellow mustard seed, one teaspoon of celery seed, and now we're gonna bring this mixture to a very mild simmer over medium low or low heat. You do not wanna let it evaporate, so keep an eye on it. Lest we forget, one of the most quintessential spices in bread and butter pickles, dried turmeric. And this week at the farmer's market, I finally pulled the trigger on one of these gorgeous handcrafted knives from Element Fay, made right here on Guamus Island in Western Washington. So I'm really excited to go ahead and process this rhubarb. To start, we're gonna cut off the leaf end and the butt end, or whatever you call that, I don't know. <laughs> and now I like to do something called a rolling gem cut. You could just cut this straight down the middle and into little bits, but this is a little bit prettier. It makes it look a little more elegant and it's kind of fun. So we go ahead and cut at an angle and then we roll the rhubarb, cut at another angle. And you just keep rolling and cutting at an angle and you get these really pretty little gem cuts. And that way when you're serving your pickles, people will go, wow, is that a rolling gem cut? And you'll say, <laughs> Of course. <laughs> you will need about 10 cups total of rhubarb and strawberries, and you can decide the ratio between the two. So I'm gonna start measuring how much rhubarb I have and getting it into my mixing bowl. Two cups, two cups. I'm looking for about six cups total because I know I have two pints of strawberries, so I'm just gonna go ahead and prep all of this rhubarb. Okay. I have some beautiful strawberries here from Cabrera Farms that I specifically picked underripe because I want them to hold their textural integrity as we're canning and pickling them. If they're too ripe, they'll turn into mush in this process. You can even use green strawberries in this recipe. To prep, we're just gonna nip the tops off and cut them in half. The cleaner your workspace, the safer your canning process. It's extremely important to keep things tidy and sanitary. I like to use a food safe sanitizer like rubbing alcohol or a food safe bleach dilution, which is a measured two teaspoons per gallon or half a teaspoon per quart, which is 32 ounces of water. And make sure when you're making a food safe bleach dilution that you're using standard disinfectant bleach with no fragrances or any other additives. Our sugar, spice, salt, and vinegar mixture has come to a simmer and everything is dissolved. So it's time to add our 10 cups of strawberry and rhubarb. Oh, it burns, vinegar. Ah. Vinegar mist does not mess around. <laughs> this only needs to simmer, low simmer, for about five minutes before we pack it into jars. And while that's coming up to a simmer, we can go ahead and prep everything else that we're going to pack into the jars. In addition to dried turmeric, I like fresh turmeric root a lot. We need one slice per pint. Be aware that when you're using fresh turmeric, it is very staining. So use a dark cutting board or surface. You don't mind getting a little bit yellow. Next, we need about the same size slice of ginger per pint. So I'm going to cut four. Next, we need about a quarter stick of cinnamon per pint. Some cinnamon bark is much easier to break up than others. This cinnamon bark is very difficult to break, but I'm gonna go ahead and do it anyways. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> uh, not that one. <laughs> this one looks a little more puny. <sighs> Take that. So we have these little bits. You could use a whole cinnamon stick, but I think it will be a little bit too intense. This is a bag of pickling spice, but I'm just gonna go ahead and steel for all spice berries from it. Next, we need four cloves, one for each jar, which seems very minimal, but clove, again, is a super strong flavor, and we wanna keep everything in balance. I'm gonna smell the ingredients. I don't know why, but I wanna smell them. <laughs> what a journey we just went on. <laughs> You wanna keep an eye on the boil in your canning pot. If it's boiling too heavily, it can leak a lot of water out, which reduces the amount you have in your pot, which can affect your recipe. So it's ideal to keep a boiling kettle of water on hand. You don't wanna add cold water to your canning pot because that temperature differential can affect your jars and your seals. So this is just barely getting to a nice little simmer. I'm gonna give it a stir 
and we're about to pack our jars. Now that this is at a good simmer, I'm gonna go ahead and turn the heat off while I pull my sterilized jars out. You wanna make sure that when you're grabbing the jars, the jar tongs are underneath that lip and you wanna pour through the wide side of your tongs and not through this side because the hot water can travel up the tines and burn you. To each jar, we're just gonna go ahead and add our slices of fresh turmeric, fresh ginger, quarter cinnamon stick, one allspice berry each, one clove each, a little pinch of fresh cilantro, which you can omit if you hate cilantro. This might be overkill, but I like safety. This is one eighth of a teaspoon of citric acid per pint and one half teaspoon of peppercorns per pint. This last time I was in the spice section, I was feeling a little experimental. So I got the four color peppercorns. You can use black if you like. We're gonna put our jar funnel in and we are going to fill our jars to half an inch headspace. I really like strawberry rhubarb bread and butter pickles with goat cheese, like on a crostini. I think it goes really well with cottage cheese, which I know some people hate, on cheese plates or with charcuterie. Honestly, it's almost kind of like a chutney, so you can use it in that way too. I also just really like when I'm setting up like a picnic or a table spread, I like having multiple kinds of pickles out just for fun. And these are really punchy, they're sweet, and they're very unique. Most people will have never heard of them before and you'll be the belle of the ball. So we're getting down to the end of it here and I'm just gonna go ahead and continue to add a little bit more until I feel like we're at nearly where we need to be but we wanna keep that half inch headspace in mind. Headspace is incredibly important. It's what gives you a proper seal. So do not estimate, use a tool or a ruler. I'm just gonna go ahead and tap these a little bit, settle them down in there. And I'm gonna grab my headspace measure and debubbler and go ahead and just very gently go around the rim of the jar releasing any bubbles that might be trapped. Air bubbles are not good because they can give bacteria a place to hide. They also will readjust your headspace afterwards potentially. And to be honest, I don't, I'm not a air bubbles in the jar expert per se. I just know that you can't have them. So we debubble. Now let's go ahead and find our half inch step. And that one is so close, but not quite there. That looks good. There's a little bit extra in here, which you can totally just put into a container and pop it in your fridge, but it's not really enough to can. I'm gonna use a paper towel that I fold into sections. I'm gonna dip this in some hot water and go ahead and wipe the rims of all the jars. This is very important. It is a step you cannot miss. And I know a lot of people use cloths, but my professional food safety training tells me that Paper towels are single use and there is no bacteria in here. So I use a paper towel. See all that stuff? That was gonna be on the lip of the jar. If there's anything right here on this lip of the jar that can cause seal failures or it can kind of rot and get gross, you really want everything super clean. Now we're gonna grab our magnet stick and get our lids on here. Very gently grab your magnet stick, make sure the gum side is down silver on top, place it on the jar and use your finger. That's fine because this top surface never makes contact with food or you can just tip that over like that. However you wanna do it. Just do not touch the gum side. Now, when you place your rings, you wanna twist them until they don't naturally wanna twist anymore. So put the ring on, let it spin and when it doesn't spin anymore, you're gonna turn it just a tiny bit more. Over tightening your jars is dangerous and can affect the seal. Because when these jars are in the pot, they are actually releasing a little bit of air and they need to be allowed to do that. But after the air bubble leaves, that lid comes back down and seals it, you know? We want air to be able to come out, but nothing to come in. So we twisted it till it won't go anymore and just about a quarter turn. And this is something you just get by feel. Okay. We are ready to get our jars in the hot bath. You wanna make sure that when you grab your jars, this is under that lip so that you've got something to hang on to. It is 
Very important that your jars are sitting nicely upright in the water bath. They cannot tip over. You cannot process jars on their side. And this is where our ruler comes in. We want at least one inch of water over top the jars, not exceeding two. So now we need to check. And we're good. We have about one and a half inches of water in there. So we are just going to secure the lid, turn down the heat just a little bit so it doesn't boil all the water away and set a timer for 10 minutes. Okay, our timer has gone off. So we are going to remove the lid, turn off the heat and set another timer for five minutes. And you wanna let the jars rest in the bath for five minutes before you take them out. Our five minute rest period has passed. So we are going to gently remove the jars. You can tip a little bit of the water off the top, but you do not wanna jostle these in this state. Very carefully set them on a cloth or some kind of rack. Setting them directly on a cold counter can cause a temperature differential enough to shatter the jar. Okay, your jars need to sit in the same place, untouched for 24 hours for the seal to really properly take hold. After 24 hours, you're going to gently remove the rings and test the seal. To do that, you're going to lift the jar up by the edge of the lid. You don't wanna pry, but you will lift it up. If the lid stays secured, it's sealed. Then you're gonna to wanna to give the jars a quick wipe or rinse and label them before storing. And do not store them with the rings. The reason why we don't store jars with the rings is because if the seal fails and the food begins to rot, you won't know if the ring is on because it will keep it locked in there. If the ring is off, the lid will come off if there's something wrong. These pickles are unique and I guarantee most people you know have never tried them. They're punchy, they're fun, and they taste like summer. I really like them with goat cheese on a crostini or on a table spread or a picnic. You can also use them somewhat like a chutney. I hope you try making these delicious spring bread and butter pickles. Mm. Like and subscribe.